don't know about your family, but ours have always enjoyed some of the classic movies. One of our favorites starred Doris Day and James Garner titled, titled Move Over Darling. Plot is a bit complicated, but provides some hilarious encounters between the two stars. In the beginning of the movie, James Garner, who's named Nick Arden, and Doris Day in the film, Ellen Wagstaff Arden, are on a trip by plane when the plane crashes into the ocean. Nick is rescued, but Ellen can't be found, so she's eventually declared lost at sea. After five years searching for his wife, Nick decides to move on with his life. He meets another woman, Bianca, played by Polly Bergen, and on one particular day, he decides to have Ellen declared legally dead so he can marry Bianca. On that very day, however, Ellen, his wife, returns home after having been found alive on an island. She discovers that her husband has remarried but hasn't begun his honeymoon yet, so she finds the newlyweds at a motel ready to begin their honeymoon. She then reveals herself to Nick. This leaves Nick in a predicament. Does he reunite with his wife or go ahead with the honeymoon in marriage to Bianca? In the meantime, Nick finds out that while Ellen has been on a deserted island, she hasn't been there alone. She was surviving on the island with Stephen Burkett, played by Chuck Connors of Rifleman fame. When Nick finds out about this life that Ellen and Steve has shared on the island where they call each other Adam and Eve, he becomes jealous, assuming the worst about their relationship. Nick goes to check out this potential rival, discovering that he is a handsome, athletic man who hints that he and Ellen had had some good times while they were marooned. As you can imagine, there are many humorous encounters between Nick and Ellen. What did you do on the island? You must have had a good time with Adam, Nick exclaims. Ellen comes back with, well, why did you wait for me? Instead, you found another woman. In the meantime, Nick's mother has him arrested for bigamy, since he is simultaneously married to two women. In a hilarious courtroom scene, all the parties appear before a judge who is exasperated by the complexity of the situation before him. Both women ask for a divorce from Nick, but in the end, while Bianca leaves Nick, Ellen comes back and is re reunited with Nick and her two girls. If you haven't seen this movie recently, you should check it out for a really fun, feel-good movie. In the scripture we are going to examine today, we also find a story where some assumptions are made which turn out eventually not to be true. And at the end of the day, everyone realizes that they should have been careful not to jump to conclusions, but rather discover the other party's true intentions before doing anything rash. Last week, we looked at the various land assignments given to the 12 tribes. The passage we are studying today reminds us that before Israel began to conquer the lands of Canaan west of the Jordan, they first had success winning land to the east of the river as well. This land was promised to two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, which also retained territory on the west of the Jordan. Let's begin with the first portion of Joshua 22. Joshua summoned the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh and told them, You've done everything Moses the Lord's servant commanded you, and have obeyed me in everything I commanded you. You have not deserted your brothers even once this whole time, but have carried out the requirement of the command of the Lord your God. Now that he has given your brothers rest, just as he promised them, return to your homes in your own land, that Moses, the Lord's <coughs> servant, gave you across the Jordan. Only carefully obey the command and instruction that Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you to love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, keep his commands, be loyal to him, and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Joshua blessed them and sent them on their way, and they went to their homes. Moses had given territory to half the tribe of Manasseh and Bashan, but Joshua had given territory to the other half with their brothers on the west side of the Jordan. When Joshua sent them to their homes and blessed them, he said, Return to your homes with great wealth, a huge number of cattle, 
and silver, gold, bronze, iron, and a large quantity of clothing. Share the spoil of your enemies with your brother. In the first few verses of the chapter, no, Joshua notes how loyal these tribes have been in following through on their commitments to assisting their brothers with conquering the lands of Canaan. After commending them, Joshua then reminds them in verse 5 to keep the commandments given to them by the Lord through Moses. He also tells them, We've had some great victories along the way which have resulted in great plunder. Take some of the livestock, clothing, and precious metals home with you and share it with those who remain in your homelands. Let's continue with the next few verses, beginning at verse 9. The Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh in the land of Canaan to return to their own land of Gilead, which they took possession of according to the Lord's command through Moses. When they came to the region of the Jordan in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh built a large, impressive altar there by the Jordan. Then the Israelites heard it said, Look, the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan at the region of the Jordan, on the Israelite side. When the Israelites heard this, the entire Israelite community assembled at Shiloh to go to war against them. In these few verses, the casual reader, reader will think, no big deal here. The tribes on their way home decide to build a big altar. This is pretty commonplace for the people of Israel. They're always building different commemorative altars out of rocks. Here's just another example. But then we note in verse 12 that there was evidently a problem with this big pile of rocks that the eastern tribes built. In fact, the western tribes were ready to go to war over this altar. So what is the problem here? First, let's look at where this altar was built. They were still on the west side of the Jordan, and they build a very large altar near, near Gilgal, which we've noted before is where, we, as we saw in chapters 4 and 5, where Israel built a pillar of memorial stones and then circumcised their male constituents. Now, just as in the plots of many movies, one party's actions are misinterpreted by another party, and they make a big stink about it. Apparently, the western tribes assumed that the reason the eastern tribes built this mammoth altar was so they could honor the local gods with sacrifices, an action which, if true, would be a major offense against not only God, but against the religious culture Israel was trying to institute as they entered the promised land. Notice in verse 12, the ones who are said to take offense at this action is the entire Israelite community. Now wait, aren't these two and a half tribes part of the nation of Israel? The half that resided on the west side, that of the half tribe of Manasseh, were included in the entire Israelite community. But what does that say about the group had fought alongside their brothers, leaving their loved ones to fend for themselves in the sections east of the Jordan, which is called the Transjordan? Let's continue our reading, however, see that there were at least some elements of the main body of Israelites that thought they should do a little investigation before acting too rashly. Beginning at verse 13 now. The Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest to the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. They sent ten leaders with him, one family leader for each tribe of Israel. All of them were heads of their ancestral families along the clans, among the clans of Israel. They went to the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead and told them, This is what the Lord's entire community says. What is this treachery you have committed today against the God of Israel by turning away from the Lord and building an altar for yourselves so that you are in rebellion against the Lord today? Wasn't the iniquity of Peor, which brought a plague on the Lord's community, enough for us? We've not cleansed ourselves from it even to this day. And now would you turn away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he will be angry with the entire community of Israel. 
But if the land you possess is defiled, cross over to the land the Lord possesses where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take possession of it among us. But don't rebel against the Lord or against us by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Wasn't Achan, son of Zerah, unfaithful regarding what was set apart for destruction, bringing wrath on the entire community of Israel? He was not the only one who perished because of his iniquity. The Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh answered the heads of the Israelite clans. The mighty one, God the Lord, the mighty one, God the Lord, he knows, and may Israel also know, do not spare us today if it was in rebellion or treachery against the Lord that we have built for ourselves an altar to turn away from him. May the Lord himself hold us accountable if we intended to offer built burnt offerings and grain offerings on it, or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it. We actually did this from a specific concern that in the future your descendants might say to our descendants, what relationship do you have with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between us and you descendants of Reuben and Gad. You have no share in the Lord. So your descendants may cause our descendants to stop fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let's take action and build an altar for ourselves, but not for burnt offering or sacrifice. Instead, it is to be a witness between us and you and between the generations after us, so that we may carry out the worship of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to our descendants, you have no share in the Lord. We thought that if they said this to, or, to, or, to us or to our generations in the future, we would reply, look at the replica of the Lord's altar that our ancestors made, not for burnt offering or sacrifice, but as a witness between us and you. We would never ever rebel against the Lord or turn away from him today by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offering, or sacrifice other than the altar of the Lord our God, which is in front of his tabernacle. Now first note that the ones who were sent to investigate were Phineas, son of Eleazar, who was a priest assigned to these Transjordan tribes. But also note that the representatives from the ten other leaders from each of the twelve tribes, including a leader from Manasseh, which had holdings on both sides of the Jordan River, accompanied him. Why is Phineas important here? In Numbers 25, it was noted that Israel committed a grievous sin. They worshipped the god of the Moabites, Baal, at Peor. As a result, God's anger burned against Israel, and he instructed Moses to take all the leaders of the people and execute them as punishment. Phineas, a priest, tried to stop God's anger against his people by taking a spear and impaling a mixed-race couple, an Israelite man and a Midianite woman. Even though God had already sent a plague among them which killed 24,000 Israelites, Phineas' actions helped stem God's wrath against his people. Here, Phineas, the hero of this previous story, is again called upon to investigate whether another major punishment is going to be sent on all of Israel again because of some of their people possibly committing an another grievous sin against God. He, with the ten investigators from the other tribes, laid out the accusation against their brothers. In verses 16 through 18 they ask, Why are you building this immense altar? It would seem that you are about to use it as a place where you are going to make sacrifices to the local gods. If that's your plan, you will cause God to take righteous judgment against all of Israel. They reminded them about what happened to Achan when he stole some religious idols of the local gods and the defeat they suffered at Ai as a result. This was a major accusa accusation against the Transjordan tribes about their intent in building such a huge altar near their own place of holy worship at Gilgal. 
Beginning in verse 21, we see the defensive response of the Transjordan tribes. No, no, you've got it all wrong. Notice how they begin with a double statement. The mighty one, God the Lord. The mighty one, God the Lord. Your version may be slightly different, but what this is, exclaims is something like, be assured the God of Israel is the only God. We proclaim this with all our hearts. They go on to explain their true reasoning in building this large altar. They intended it to be a reminder to future generations that lived on the east side of the Jordan when they looked across to the west side of the Jordan. The God we worship with all our hearts is over here. Don't look at any of the gods of the local people. Remember that we worship the God of Israel at his holy site at the tabernacle of God. We want our future generations to remember that we are part of a great nation and most of the nation resides on the west side of the Jordan. This altar was built here as a witness to that fact. Let's now read the last few verses to see how this incident was resolved, beginning at verse 30. When the priest Phineas and the community leaders, the heads of Israel's clans, clans who were with him, heard what the descendants of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to say, they were pleased. Phineas, son of Eleazar the priest, said to the descendants of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this treachery against him. As a result, you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's power. Then the priest Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and the leaders returned from the Reubenites and Gadites in the land of Gilead to the Israelites in the land of Canaan and brought back a report to them. The Israelites were pleased with the report and they blessed God. They spoke no more about going to war against them to ravage the land where the Reubenites and Gadites live. So the Reubenites and Gadites named the altar, It is a witness between us that the Lord is God. There's almost a sigh of relief that goes out to the reader as their situation is, is diffused almost as soon as the Transjordan tribes finishes their explanation. Oh, so you didn't build this great altar as a completing uh, religious site. Then we are fine with your explanation. In fact, we commend you that you build it so that your current and future generations will remember that they are a part of Israel. Their relief is expressed in verse 31. Today, we know that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this treachery against him. As a result, you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's power. The issue resolved, Phineas and the 10 leaders went back to report this good news to the rest of Israel. It immediately tamped down any spirit of going to war, brother against brother. The peace and unity of Israel was now restored. As a result, the Reubenites and Gadites gave the, their altar a name, Witness, for it served as a witness to the people on both sides of the Jordan, that they were one people and God on high was their exclusive God. This was a great story, almost movie script worthy. There was tension between brothers that rose because of a misunderstanding about the intentions of one side that almost resulted in the two sides going to war. But once an explanation was given for the action, then everyone is at, was at peace again. Everything was right with the world. Once again, let's mine some principles for living from this story. One, get all the facts before taking major action in a potentially volatile situation. How often has that happened? In fact, this is a major plot point in great stories. Someone does something that could be construed as being an offensive action against someone else, but it really was not meant to be offensive at all. Many times, the parties do go to war before finally the hero steps in to correct the misperception. Has that happened to you? Have you been offended at someone, even a brother or sister, whose action was not even remotely an action that should have been taken the way it was? 
That is why even Mr. Rogers teaches that when you get angry, it's better to count to ten before you blow up. It's better for the fellowship, for people to truly understand why someone does something the way that they do before reacting in a major way. Number two, realize that worshiping God together can bring people together even though they may have major differences. Before we look at how we are different from one another, let's try to see how we are alike. I've been in all kinds of worship services in many different cultures. In some cultures, people respond to a pastor's words by jumping up and shouting, Amen, or That's right, that's right. At other times, we may see a brother or sister sitting there in their seat, huddle over when the worship leaders ask everyone to stand and sing with all their heart. That person may be dealing with some sin or major, major issue in their own life at that moment where they need to be left alone to deal with it on their own. We all have different ways that we worship, but remember that we worship the same God, whether we are an African worship enthusiastically in a block building, a Chinese Christian worshiping behind closed doors in a house church, or an American raising their arms at a service where the Spirit is working in their hearts and lives and actions. Number three, obeying God's commandments will help us identify with Him as the one true God. God has graciously given us clear commandments for how to live our lives. We have to be careful that we read God's Word with understanding so we can know what to do as a dynamic Christian and what not to do. God has placed those commandments in His Word so we can know them and when we understand them, we can obey what He commands us to do. Has this message from God's Word tugged at your heart? Have you recognized in it that sometimes we act too hastily when interpreting another brother's or sister's action? If so, are you ready to take action to reach out to other brothers and sisters as one big family?